do some occasional virtual uh, hybrid events, but uh, generally we're virtual now because the logistics are just so much easier. Um, tonight's speaker is right there, Nick Levine. Um, let me back up to that. So yes, we really can see that from space. And Nick is a data scientist at Ursa Space. And we'll go through these slides one more time and then I'll hand it off to him. Um, two weeks from tonight, we'll have uh, Gabriel Philip Santos uh, talking about dinosaurs, dragons, and dragonite, and paleontology and storytelling. Um, and if you like what we're doing here, you can donate uh, there. And um, coming up, I'm going to stop sharing and just uh, say what else is coming up, uh, what else is coming up after Gabe. Uh, we'll have some of Toby Alt's students, and, and Toby is a climatologist at Cornell um, and had his students do some, some interesting uh, project work that uh, I think we're going to share. Um, but I don't have the full details, and I'm not quite sure that's the, the theme. And then in uh, May, the first session in May will, I believe, be uh, as a sort of update on the Cornell University Borehole Observatory and the Deep Geothermal Project for um, heating campus the, with the goal of heating campus using uh, deep geothermal heat. Uh, and then at the end of May, we'll be uh, talking about uh, updating the electrical grid um, and what needs to happen for, for that to, to work as we decarbonize things. Um, and uh, I am now gonna hand it off to Nick. Take it away, Nick. Okay. And I, I also, Mike has spilled the beans that you're also a Geneseo grad as Mike and I are, which is how I know Mike. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for the introduction, Don, and the invitation. I'm really excited to be here. Yes, thanks for joining us. And I'll note uh, if Nick and I chatted before uh, that if uh, folks have questions, they can bring them up as we go along. Or uh, And I expect we'll have a good discussion after he's done presenting. So now I'll say, take it away, Nick. All right, cool. So yeah, you've already heard I'm a data scientist. I work for a uh, startup located right, uh, quote unquote, here in Ithaca called Ursa Space Systems. Uh, oops. Uh, and so I think my the goal for my talk tonight is I'd like uh, everybody here to go at least once, think to themselves, hmm, I didn't did not realize that we could see that from space. Um, so if that happens, I'll consider it a success. So, uh, there we go. So, like I said, I work for Ursa Space Systems. We are a US based satellite intelligent company um, that provides business and government decision makers access to on demand analytic solutions. In particular, uh, we specialize in synthetic aperture radar, which is going to be the main topic of the talk tonight. Um, so, synthetic aperture radar, or otherwise known as SAR, uh, is a type of satellite imagery that, uh, for various reasons, I'm uh, I have a, a gut feeling that most people on the call, uh, unless they you know know me personally, uh, have not heard of before. Um, and it's not your fault. I mean, it's it's a it's an, a very amazing technology, but it's not well known. Um, and there are various reasons for that we'll get into. But uh, it's uh, yeah, lots of science, scientific and technical reasons for that. Um, so let's. Uh, before we before we dive into the specifics of what star is, um, I just want to show you some images because it's not what you expect um, uh, a satellite image to look like. Uh, if you go on Google Earth, you're not going to uh, see any uh, star images there. So let's just start off by checking out a few images. Here we've got a nice picture of Barcelona, Spain. So on the left, we've got an aerial uh, photograph of these beautiful courtyards they have, and on the right, we've got the SAR image. So first time you look at this, you might think, OK, it's just a black and white image. OK, I got it. Simple enough. Um, but the more and more you look at it, the more and more weird things you're going to see uh, that, yeah, that don't show up in a regular uh, color photo. So and we'll, we'll dive into them. But um, yeah, definitely not a black and white photo. So here we've got a picture of a bridge in China or some uh, interesting landscapes with vegetation, trees.
Here's Cedar Point, the amusement park in Ohio. So you can see all the various roller coasters and rides there. I think they, they show up pretty cool in this. Uh, here's a little zoomed in view. So you should be starting to see, okay, there's something going on here that's not like a typical image. Here's a uh, golden copper mine in Indonesia. Pretty breathtaking. Downtown Pittsburgh, see the stadiums there, skyscrapers. Zooming in, seems like a cluttered mess. There's there's uh, patterns to this chaos though. So what am I gonna talk about tonight? First, first half of the talk, I wanna talk about, uh, introduce you to SAR, it's a little bit of its history and the science behind this sensing modality. And then in the second half of the talk, I'm going to talk about a few things that we here at Ursa Space are doing, are using SAR for. So let's dive right in because we got a lot to talk about. So SAR goes back to the 50s. Uh, this guy, Carl A. Wiley, who's an engineer at what is now Lockheed Martin, is widely considered to be the inventor. Uh, it very much starts out as a military project for surveillance reconnaissance. Um, one of the the two uh, things that make that makes SAR very attractive for this is that it can see at night and it can see through clouds. Um, so if, yeah, that should be readily apparent why it's interesting to military folks. Um, right here, we've got the first ever successful SAR image um, from 1957. We've got a little airport there in Michigan. Um, and I should note here that we're not quite in space yet. Uh, this is, these are on aircraft in the atmosphere. So then fast forward through the 60s, technology starts improving. Uh, this, on the top, we've got the original photo I showed you on the previous slide. Right below it, we've got the same uh, image taken a few years later with better technology. So things look a little crisper, less blurry, more even. Um, but still, we're, we're not in space yet. Um, in the 60s, the US government tried to attach this on fighter jets and use this in Vietnam to various success. The technology wasn't quite there yet. So then 1964, SAR goes to space finally, pop it on a satellite, the National Reconnaissance Office, they call it Project Quill. Uh, it was classified at the time, uh, but you can see on the right, some of the first uh, synthetic aperture radar images taken from space. And so, as I've said, uh, SAR up until this point was the purvey of governments and militaries. But starting in the 90s, we start to see more partnerships between space agencies and commercial entities. So in 95, you get RadarSat in Canada, 2007 Terrasar X in Germany, and 2010 Cosmos SkyMed in Italy. Uh, RadarSat's no longer in operation, but the other two are still going, still providing imagery for researchers and uh, businesses around the world. And in terms of commercial SAR, the big breakthrough happens in 2014, where you could say SAR goes democratic. The European Space Agency launches a satellite called Sentinel-1. And the amazing thing about what they decide is they decide to give all of its imagery away for free. Uh, so this is this imagery is available online. Anybody can download it, use it. Um, it's got a 10 meter resolution and it images the entire globe every six to 12 days. And on top of that, uh, they created this uh, technology transfer business incubation office, uh, basically to mentor startups to start using this data. And since then, they've mentored over 700 startups. And um, so 2014 is also the year that URSA is founded. Um, yeah. So big, big game changer for the SAR industry in 2014. And then since then, SAR has just kept getting better and better. So on the left in this image, you've got uh, Terrace RX that I talked about in the, a few slides ago. Uh, it's this ma massive satellite, five meters by 2.5 meters uh, compared to a human. Lots of energy to get this thing into orbit. Whereas now uh, companies are launching these things, they're calling them CubeSats because they're like little cubes, less than 100 pounds, um, very tiny. And once they get into space, they expand into these big things. But um, so with the size down, the weight down, and with uh, 
launches into space becoming much more cost effective. The number of SAR satellites is growing rapidly, commercial SAR satellites. Um, so at the end of 2022, we had 69 SAR satellites in orbit. And by the end of 2023, we're expected to have 143. And that number just keeps going up. So this is where Ursa comes in. Like I said, I mentioned we started in 2014. Uh, our founder was originally going to start trying to make his own satellite, uh, put it in space, our founders, I should say, um, but decided to pivot. Uh, we decided that there's so much satellite imagery out there uh, and it's very difficult to use. We'll get into SAR. It's very complicated to use, complicated to test these satellites. So where Ursa comes in is we are a kind of a hub to order satellite imagery, to task satellites, to download, uh, process the imagery. And then we also run analytics on top of that. So you'll see we've got a bunch of different satellite vendors on the bottom. And then we also partner with uh, other types of uh, companies that um, provide other types of remote sensing data that we can then uh, combine with our analytics to yield different insights. So I mentioned our SAR platform where we aggregate uh, vendor imagery. And so we have over 30 million archived images on our catalog. Anybody, anybody watching this can go to our website, make an account and, and browse them, purchase them. So we're talking about big data here. And when you hear big data, it's not always just the volume. It's, so usually when people talk about big data, there's three Vs of big data, volume, velocity, and variety. In terms of volume, we're talking about uh, commercial satellite companies uh, collecting hundreds of terabytes per day, every day. So that adds up to petabytes per year per company. And I mean, it, when the numbers get this big, it doesn't, I I had to provide some sort of scale, but I don't even know if it helps. But one petabyte is about 20 million tall filing cabinets of printed text. Uh, so, and this is just for like a single company. There, And you saw in the previous slide, there are lots of companies out there. Um, in terms of velocity, um, 100 terabytes every day. That's a lot of data. And it's only going to get faster. Right now, satellites are limited uh, by the speed they can communicate their images back down to Earth. They have to be actually directly over um, the ground relay station to transmit these large files down to Earth. But within the next few years, many companies are starting to send up relay constellations that are essentially going to be internet in space. So to allow uh, basically near real-time communication with the satellites. And in terms of variety, like I mentioned, there's lots of other uh, sensors up in space, uh, also collecting lots of data. And there's lots of sensors uh, on the ground. The Internet of Things is big. Uh, everyone has a phone. Um, yeah, there's lots of remote sensing geospatial out data out there. So that's one big data. All right, so now you're probably wondering, okay, you've been hinting at it, what the heck actually is SAR though? So SAR stands for Synthetic Aperture Radar. And in a, in a sentence, Synthetic Aperture Radar is a form of radar collected from a moving platform. Um, and so now I'm just gonna break down what each of these parts mean, and we'll start with radar. So radar is what's called in, in the uh, remote sensing community an active sensor. Uh, as opposed to a passive sensor. So a camera without a flash is, is a passive sensor in that the light comes from the sun, bounces off an object, and then goes to the camera. Uh, radar is an active sensor in that the signal is emitted by the sensor, goes to the object, and comes back. So an active sensor is kind of like adding flash to your camera. Uh, you're, you're illuminating the scene with some light, and that's affecting what you see. Uh, in particular, radar or radar stands for radio detection and ranging. Uh, so you can see in the cartoon, the radar antenna it sends out a light wave. Excuse me. For SAR, we're talking about uh, microwaves, uh, in particular wavelengths of around like centimeters. I think so. The radar wave uh, or the radar sends out a radio wave. It goes out into the world hits an object, most of that light gets scattered away, doesn't make it back to the satellite ever, but then some of it does come back. And so you can determine uh, how far away that object was based on how long it took the light to go there and back. And then you can also determine um, some properties about it based on how much of the light made, back, made it back. So this is the basic principle of radar. 
Um, and so you might think, okay, great, let's put a strap a radar to a satellite, get it into space, start uh, taking some pictures. Um, unfortunately, not quite that easy. So if you're to do that based on the satellites I was showing you um, with the antenna that they have, or in other words, or an aperture or just the lens basically of the camera, um, it's not really big enough to get high resolution imagery. So um, you would get really blurry pictures like this, as opposed to like the nice crisp uh, optical imagery you've got here. Um, so the problem is that the radar aperture size, which is just like the size of the antenna here, um, determines the resolution that you can get. Um, so how fine of an area you can get information from. And it turns out that if you wanted to get uh, high resolution imagery of the earth, like I showed you earlier from space, you would need a radar with an aperture the size of a football field or even multiple football fields. And uh, obviously that's not feasible in space. Uh, if it was, you would have heard about it because you'd see these giant football fields floating by every night, right? Um, so what's the what's the solution there? Uh, it's a bunch of tricky math and signal processing. So what SAR takes advantage of, and this is where the synthetic aperture comes in, is the fact that the satellite is moving in a very predictable continuous path. And so as the satellite's moving, it's sending radar, radar or radio waves down to the scene. They're bouncing off, coming back. And then the satellite stitches all that information together, does a bunch of advanced single processing, and synthesizes a much larger aperture to create the image. And so that's, this is where you get the nice crisp uh, images that I was showing earlier. And I'll say this is the slide where I'm doing the most amount of hand waving. There's a lot of work that, that goes into this, a lot of math. Um, but so, so this is what I mean when I say SAR is very complicated. And it's amazing that it works at all. So what are you actually seeing in a SAR image? Um, so what you're seeing is backscatter, and that, that's just a name for the light that makes it back to the satellite. Um, in general, smooth surfaces don't show up in SAR. Um, if you remember back to your intro physics class, the, uh, on smooth surfaces, the angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence. So on smooth surfaces, that uh, light just bounces right off and goes off into space, never comes back. If you've got bumpy surface, more of that light will get reflected back to the satellite. And if you get really bumpy surfaces, um, there's a much higher chance you'll get light back. So um, when you see dark spots, or, or sorry, when you see bright spots or white spots in SAR, that's usually rough surfaces. And if you think back to the images I showed you at the start, any water was usually the darkest part of that image because smooth water surfaces. So not all targets uh, look how you might think they look like from an uh, optical image. They, they, they don't look like what we're used to thinking of in images. So uh, here on the left, you've got the National Monument. It hardly shows up. It scatters light all over the place. Uh, next to that, you've got a uh, industrial power line, which you can't you can barely see it at all, but you can see its shadow. And then on the right, we've got a bunch of aircraft and helicopters also very, uh, very faint and unclear. Um, but what's common to all these examples is even though the objects themselves don't scatter light perfectly back to the uh, satellite, the it's still the shadow still shows up because the object is still preventing light from getting underneath it. And I should just point out that the shadows are not from the sun, uh, right? Because um, the, the satellite is not observing visible light at all. In fact, you can't even tell what time of day these pictures were taken um, because SAR can image at night or during the day. There is a question in the chat, um, which I think is relevant to the slides you're on with all those SAR apparatus apparatus out there and with the number increasing, what keeps the emitted and bounce sig signals from interfering with each other? Mm. Good question. Um, so I'm, let's see, I'm thinking, and honestly, I don't, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, there is so much stuff in space, um, but also space is a very big place that I think that's the, the best answer I have for now. Um, but so I will say, um, in a particular SAR image, it's possible for different objects in the image, uh, to appear in places where they actually aren't 
So you'll see like the national monument here, it looks like it's like leaning forward. And that's just because it's a very tall object and the radar thinks it's closer to it because it's tall. And so that's why it gets kind of flattened on the image. Um, you also have cases where the satellite will send a, a signal down. It'll bounce off something, bounce off something else and do a bunch of bounces and then make it back to the satellite. Um, and so the, all those extra bounces added a bunch of extra distance. And so you can kind of, it's called multi-pathing where you can see the same object will appear in multiple locations. Um, so there is within an individual image, that's that's what I can talk to there, but good, good question. So like I mentioned, uh, SAR can see at night or during the day. It can also see through clouds. Uh, radio waves and microwaves go straight through clouds. Um, and that's a great thing for SAR because at any given time, the Earth is about 60 to 70 percent covered in clouds. So uh, cloud is your, your or, sorry, SAR is your go-to source for 24-7 global surveillance. And so then there's one more uh, scientific thing about SAR that I want to narrow in on. Um, that really makes it fascinating. Um, but before I do that, I got to back up a little bit and discuss what actually is an image. So an image, in as far as your computer is concerned, is just a rectangular array full of numbers. We call those numbers pixels. So on the left here, you see a black and white image. Each pixel is a number that tells the computer how black or how white to render it. Um, for color images, it's just each pixel has three numbers associated with it, usually red, green, and blue. And so for SAR, it turns out that <clears throat> the pixels have two values in it. Excuse me. Uh, and they, so the pixels for SAR are actually complex numbers. So if you think back to high school algebra, complex numbers, they've got a real and imaginary part. Um, and then the length of that uh, that complex number, the, the magnitude or amplitude is what we call it, uh, provides one number. And so actually all the all the star images I've been showing you so far, I've just been showing you the amplitude pixels. And then there's this whole other pixel set of pixels called the phase pixels um, that I've been hiding. And mostly I've been hiding them because they essentially all look like this. Um, and so you might ask, all right, these phase pixels are just white noise. Why? Does anyone care about them? And it turns out that there is a lot of information here, but it's only useful when you're comparing two different SAR images. So you take two images of the same place at different times where some sort of disturbance has happened in between. And then you take the difference between these phase pixels and you get all sorts of gnarly patterns. Um, so this is uh, in Iceland in 2021 and 2022. Uh, I'm not gonna try to pronounce this volcano, but uh, it erupted twice and there was lots of seismic activity for several months. Um, so what you're looking at here is the difference before and after the event of these phase pixels for two SAR images. And so what this is telling you, um, every time you see a stripe, you, that's some sort of disturbance where like the ground has shifted between the two images. And so you see there's lots of stripes connected together closer to the volcano, indicating that there's lots of uh, movement going on in the ground. And so if you take not just two images, but lots of images over a time period, you can actually measure how much the Earth is moving down to the level of millimeters. So here we're looking at the same scene, but now the map is colored by how much horizontal displacement there has been over, over the past two years. And so you can see these, these two tectonic plates that are rubbing up against each other to have the volcano um, are actually you know, shifting apart and we can actually quantify that precisely on a giant kilometer scale, which is just absolutely incredible to me. There's another product that you can get from these uh, phase pixels called a coherence map. Um, there's, it's fairly technical, so I, I don't wanna go into it too much, but it also detects disturbances. And so you can see here on the left, we've got this coherence map where uh, the purple are regions where there's little disturbance and then the fuzzy uh, confetti pixels are where there's been disturbance. And you can see that this matches pretty well with the uh, extent of the lava um, from the volcano on the right. And you can measure this from space without you know, having to get close to the lava. So that's a plus. And then one more application of these phase pixels. Here I've got two SAR images left and right at different times. 
Uh, we're looking at some sort of field, not entirely sure what's there, could be dirt, could be grass, um, but you see it's empty in the first one, and then there's a few objects in it in the second one. Not entirely sure what those are, but, and it doesn't look like anything else has changed, but if we do this coherent processing, and this is called coherent change detection <clears throat> on the face pixels, it actually reveals a bunch of tire tracks in whatever this is. So this is tire tracks in the mud, tire tracks in grass, just grass being depressed just a little bit. And SAR can detect that. And uh, so now we can see that these guys have been having fun doing donuts. Right, so that was a lot. You, I think you hope you believe me now that SAR is a complicated thing. And now I want to shift over and talk about some applications here at our site. So we'll start off with monitoring illegal fishing. Um, obviously a very tricky task. Uh, countries that want to monitor um, hundreds of miles of coastline, hundreds of miles off, offshore, not very feasible. Um, one thing they do have in their pockets to do this is called AIS, uh, Automatic Identification Systems. Uh, the IMO, International Maritime Organization, requires that vessels of a certain size broadcast this. It's basically like GPS for ships. Um, at every 30, 40 seconds, the ship has to say, hey, I'm here. This is where I am. This is where I'm going. This is my name. Um, and so if you're you know, a government, you want to track ships, see where they're going, um, this is great. The only problem is it's very easy for a captain of a ship to just turn off their transponder if they want to. Um, not be observed. And so there are various legitimate reasons for why a captain might want to do this, such as they're going through an area where there's a lot of pirate activity. They don't want to broadcast their uh, location, but they also do this if they want to do something nefarious. Uh, say they want to go fish uh, in an area that's where it's not allowed. They want to fish more than they're supposed to. They're a shipping vessel that wants to trade with another vessel from a sanctioned country, maybe. Um, so vessels that have turned off their AAS transponder are what we call quote unquote dark, um, but they're not dark in the sense that they've disappeared from the ocean. So if we take a, uh, a, a satellite image, SAR lets us do that day or night and through clouds, and then we compare that. So this is that data fusion that I mentioned earlier. We compare that to the AIS signals in the, at that area at that time. We can match up vessels that we detect automatically with our proprietary algorithms. And if a certain vessel that we see in the image doesn't have a corresponding AES signal, we know that vessel's dark, and then we can pass that information along to our customer. Another application, perhaps the biggest application and oldest application in URSA is oil storage or oil storage product. So when they refine uh, crude oil, they put them into these giant cylindrical tanks that you see here. This one is in Cushing, Oklahoma. It's a big hub. And crucial for us is that the lids on these tanks float. So the more oil there is, the higher the lid will be. So I think you can see where I'm going. If you take a picture from space, you see how high the lid is. You do some simple math, and then you can figure out how much oil is in the tank. Do that for all the tanks in the site, and you can figure out how much oil they have. So here's an example of just that, the same site in Cushing, where we've got our measurements overlaid. And uh, I chose Cushing for this example because this is one of the few sites where the U.S. government actually publishes the exact inventory every week. And you can see that our measurements track very well with that. And the interesting thing here is that we publish ours two days before they publish theirs. But we don't just do it for Cushing. We do it for sites all over the world. So every dot you see here is uh, our oil tanks that we uh, monitor. We measure the amount of oil in them, and then we basically put that in a spreadsheet and send it out to our customers every week. As, as our latest expansion, we, we monitor over 950 sites, 20,000 tanks, and 6.5 billion barrels that we can track every week. So this is of interest in uh, hedge funds and other traders that trade in oil futures, in that we can get uh, very precise oil inventories worldwide, uh, perhaps months before they show up in any official reports. So um, there's another question in the chat about uh, um, 
It asks about fishing vessels or any other target detect the SAR radar from above and send up a jamming signal. Yeah, good question. Um, I don't know about jamming uh, SAR. Um, it is uh, possible. So if you think back to the image of the aircraft that we saw, so lots of aircraft um, go through, go to great pains to make themselves invisible to air to uh, radar. So that's why we don't see them in SAR too well. Um, but it would be very hard to camouflage an entire shipping vessel, uh, I would think. So, but good, good question. Uh, as far as jamming a satellite all the way up in space, I don't think that's feasible for a, a shipping vessel. Good question. What about an um, oil tank farm? If I don't know if they would want to keep. Yeah, that so they, yeah, they definitely. Um, it's not their favorite that anyone can see this from space. Um, there are oil tanks out there that have fixed top lids, um, but they are much more expensive. And we find that a lot of oil refineries just don't bother. Um, I mean, if you think about it, an oil tank with a fixed top is like like one or two steps close to being a bomb. And so they not. Yeah. <laughs> so good questions. So the last uh, application I want to talk about before we break out into questions is uh, a few various ways that URSA can provide humanitarian aid for governments and first responders. So what you're looking at here is a time lapse of two photos taken uh, when two dams broke in Mongolia and in China in 2021. So the two dams are, are circled in yellow there. And then the after you can see the wide extent of the flooding. Uh, thankfully, um, no major population centers were affected by this and no one was killed or injured. But you can immediately see the use case where this picture was taken the day of the flood and we can immediately figure out what the extent of the flooding and communicate that to first responders. And so that's exactly what um, we can do at URSA. We have algorithms to identify water and synthetic aperture radar imagery. So then we can info overlay that onto infographics that display population centers. A little bit more recent, Hurricane Ian last year in Florida. Um, we quickly spun up a dashboard with a lot of those same uh, flood extent analytics and other change detection products that we offer at URSA, uh, overlaid with roads and power lines, uh, all sorts of things that would be interesting uh, to first responders. So I hope the picture you're starting to see about URSA, um, the kind of goals that we have, um, I'll let our founder and CEO, and uh, just saying that our vision is to create a virtual mosaic of the world that anyone can interact with from their device. Um, yeah. So with that, I'll say thank you, and I'm uh, happy to take questions. Great. Thank you, Nick. That was really interesting, and I will turn it over to uh, the crowd for uh, questions. And if I don't hear any, I'll come up with some of my own. Uh, and there's another one from Martin in the chat. The bounce back single is signal must be pretty weak compared to the emitted signal. It seems like it would be fairly easy for the target to overwhelm the bounced signal with a strong jamming signal. Yep. Uh, so I will uh, not attempt to answer that. I have to. I will admit that I'm not a radar engineer, so I I don't have expertise in this. Um, one of the great things about working at URSA is a hugely interdisciplinary team. So my background is in applied math. Um, I do uh, lots of machine learning and, and data science with the images. We have a whole team of radar engineers that understand a lot of the complexities of SAR. Um, I wish I could answer that, but thank you. Good question. Other questions? And we're not a huge crowd, so if folks want to raise hands and unmute themselves, we can do that. Looks like Rob has turned off on his camera, so maybe he's gonna <laughs> ask a question. Uh, yeah, I was I was wondering if, if the kind of data that you work on is, is applied to um, ecosystems, like, and I'm not quite sure what I mean by that, but for example, tracking, say the growth of of trees or or other kinds of plants to measure productivity or or maybe looking for places where uh they've been cut down i don't know if that would actually be 
preferable than other other kinds of remote sensing, but yeah, um, absolutely. yeah. absolutely. Um, yes, there's a lot of buzz right now for using SAR um, in environmental applications. Um, one neat application I know of at URSA is doing change detection on forests where there's been a lot of logging. And so you can kind of track deforestation. Um, so this is a slide I didn't end up including in the final presentation, but um, vegetation tends to let's see. It kind of has a blurry return. It doesn't show up quite as well as uh, as buildings do. Um, it, it you know it bounces around. It gets absorbed. So there's also like a chemi chemical uh, component to this in terms of like the dielectric constant of the material. Um, but there's, uh, depending on the wavelength of radar that you use, you can get different information um, and you can use that to, there are some uh, synthetic aperture radar satellites you can use to like classify the type of crop that's in a field or the type of vegetation that's there. Um, I know people use SAR to track uh, polarized caps, see the recession, um, even to the point of like, checking um, shipping lanes to see if there's full of ice or not. So yeah, lots of interesting mm -hmm. environmental applications mm -hmm. out there. And there's a couple more uh, questions in the, in the chat from Marion asking, I presume you do a lot of classified work for the military? Yeah, so this is a, an interesting question. We, we do have a lot of government contracts, but none of the work we do is classified. Okay, that's good. I think. Yeah, so that's that's this is the the new space age, um, where we're, yeah, yep, it's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, and I noted um, before we started that my dad worked on some similar technologies way back in the '60s, and that uh, in a, in addition to doing some stuff related to Apollo missions, he also uh, worked on projects to look for. Uh, people in Southeast Asia through the uh, forest canopy, which I don't know how does, is there a relationship there? <laughs> do you, do you have a guess about that? <laughs> Sorry, can you, can you phrase the question again? Yeah. So, so my dad um, worked on what I assume was classified then in the 1960s on uh, projects looking, uh, trying to spot people belief in, in the forests of Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm guessing that's got some related technologies. And like I said, he never talked about it. I, I learned about that at his funeral. Um, but uh, is that, do you suspect that's using the same kind of radar? Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm honestly not sure. Um, yeah, like, I, like I said before, uh, SAR tends to not, show up as well um, under dense brush. Mm -hmm. uh, there is There are different bands that will penetrate into the forest different levels, but um, humans also don't show up too well in SAR. Um, yeah, we, that's interesting. Yeah, we're very smooth surfaces to the radar. We're also very small. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, and another question uh, from Becky. I teach high school science. What could I tell my students who might be interested in this field? Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, yeah, advice for, for high school students. Well, I mean, I'll just say pay attention in physics <laughs> if you're interested in this field. Um, I, I barely touch the surface uh, of the physical implications of SAR. Um, and so physics and math, if you wanna go into synthetic aperture radar, for sure. Very important. So, so free associating from that sort of, um, I was a Geneseo physics major. Were you also a Geneseo physics major? I was applied math. <clears throat> uh, okay. Okay. Um, and let's see. Uh, Mike asks, can it detect heat, gases, soil compaction, water turbidity, or other invisible conditions? Yeah. So heat, no. Uh, heat is a different uh, wavelength, um, infrared. There are infrared um, remote uh, sensors that are out there, but SAR is not one of them. Uh, gases, I 
don't believe, I believe it'll go right through, just like it goes through clouds. Uh, soil compaction, um, not entirely sure about that. Like, so like if you think back to the INSAR, we could see like the tire tracks in the desert. Um, but on a large scale, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, water turbidity. Um, so it, it, you will see, so if the ocean is rough and there's lots of waves, you will see that in the SAR. It won't just be pitch black. There'll be some noise there. Um, but we're, we're reaching the edge of my physics knowledge related to SAR. Great, great. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, next question in the chat is, with many countries now expressing an interest in doing things on the moon, can SARS be directed elsewhere into space? Yes, I believe so. I don't don't quote me on this. I think I've read somewhere that there are synthetic aperture radars in space imaging uh, other planets. But I would have to, yeah, I can't say anything certain specific yeah. about that. Yeah. Certainly makes sense for a place like Venus where it's a very cloudy um, absolutely place. Um, and my my sister sent a direct message that. Uh, um, she thinks dad was looking at looking for people using infrared or heat to see the people in the forest. Um, let's see. Uh, and some thanks in the notes. Um, and uh, Mike says your presentation could be understood by teenagers, which is a compliment. Uh, and uh, another question, assuming ideal conditions, what is the finest resolution possible? And that's a question I was going to ask, so you beat me to it, Marty. Um, could SAR detect something the size of a suitcase, a shoebox, a matchbox? Yeah, so yeah, interesting questions. Um, so the images I started the slideshow off, uh, let's see if I can go back to them, are from a relatively new vendor, uh, Umbra. And they are advertising sub-meter resolution. Um, the, the lowest I've heard is like less than half a meter resolution, which is very fine. Um, you still have to think that certain objects, yeah, um, are still not going to show up uh, in SAR um, just because of the what we talked about in terms of what, what scatters well, what comes back. Um, but yeah, the, we're definitely pushing the boundaries. But so, on, on, and another thing to think about is the finer resolution you want, the, the smaller the area you're going to have to focus your image on, um, just due to the nature of the synthetic aperture. So Sentinel, uh, the free imagery, that's 10 meter resolution. It doesn't look nearly as crisp as this, but it its images are very large. Um, yeah. Good question. Thanks. Um, and Elizabeth notes that we have mapped parts of Venus using SAR, so. Ah, great. We've got some SAR aficionados in the crowd. Love it. Great, great. I'm not surprised by that. Um, and uh, Martin says those tire tracks of someone doing donuts looked a lot smaller than a half a meter, which. For did. sure. Yeah, so that's uh, that's where those, those phase pixels come in, and they can pick up that centimeter difference. Uh, between the two images, whereas the actual image itself, the resolution might not be that much, but the, the difference, you, it can tell the difference in elevation, basically, between the two pixels. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, so it's being used for topographic models, um, and that's what I mean. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, those are called, uh, oh, I'm going to blank on it. Uh, they're called DEMS, D-E-M. Um, and yeah, you can, you can construct them with SAR. Yeah, so um, are, are, I, I gather you're looking at um, before and after of earthquakes, for example, to figure out how the ground has shifted. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, so if you go to our website, we have lots of uh, blogs uh, detailing all the different uh, use cases. Yeah. Yeah, lots of before and after possibilities. Um, I assume you do that some with like hurricanes as well and and forest fires, maybe. Absolutely. You got it. Um, so uh, how how did you end up doing this work? What's what's the story that got you to where you are today? 
Yeah, um, thanks for asking. Um, so I did undergrad at Geneseo, applied math. Um, was really loving the applied math, so I took it to Cornell. Um, and then my advisor while I was there, uh, or sorry, another person in my advisor's group at Cornell ended up working at URSA. Um, and so it had been on my radar. And then also at Cornell, I took a an entrepreneurship class. Um, so URSA has a relationship with Rev in Ithaca, which is like a startup incubator in Ithaca. Um, and so uh, Brad Treats, who taught that class, he really he really talked up URSA. It's like this is this is the startup to go to. Um, they they got really cool technology, uh, fascinating problems to work on. And then I had already known that uh, my uh, peer from Cornell worked there. So I was on my radar. And then while I was passively looking for jobs, I saw the data scientist job come up and it's been a uh, history ever since. I love it. I love working here. I learn so much every day, work with a fantastic interdisciplinary team. Cool. And how long have you been at URSA? It'll be two years this summer. Very good. And a question that came as a direct message is, um, are, are the SARS satellites in low orbit or geosynchronous? Ooh. I want to say low Earth orbit, but also a question for one of the satellite engineers in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I'm guessing low orbit um, is it makes several passes a day, right? Or uh, I mean, not necessarily several passes a day, but it makes multiple passes, right? So, yeah. Um, uh, are there other questions from folks in the audience? All right. Well, thank you very much, Nick. It was a great talk. I learned some stuff. Um, and um, two weeks from tonight, we'll have Gabe Santos talking about uh, dinosaurs in popular culture. And you can check out what's coming up in um, on the website here, which I think I copied that right. Get back to here. Lots of thank yous coming in. Oops, and I copied the wrong um, thing. Martin, Martin, I see your last question there about the price of the imagery. Um, so it all depends on how fresh the image is. So if you want uh, you want an image of the in the future, so like you want to tell us to take an image at this time in this place, that's going to be much more expensive. Uh, and it also depends on uh, the resolution you want, the vendors, um, et cetera, et cetera. But anywhere from you know, hundred dollars to several thousand dollars is is the range you can think of. Right. And uh, any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you. I guess we will. Oh, Pat, Pat has a raised hand. Go ahead, Pat. Uh, yeah. Um... I I I I asked I asked about where she were these sat satellites. If you have sixty four or or see more in a geo send up send up in you can you can pretty much cover everything. That's that's just what I asked. So um, you're not asking anything now. Yeah, just you know, just you know, commenting. If you have that, you know, many. Why keep them in in the in the low orbit, which will tend to devalue decay, and have to be boosted or 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 be replaced? But anyway, no big deal. Well, I, think, I think low Earth orbit's a lot cheaper to get into orbit, get than, into orbit than geosynchronous, but yeah. I'm not positive about that. Yeah. Okay. Any any last questions? Thanks very much, Nick. I enjoyed the talk. And good Great. to see various folks in the crowd today. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming. This was fun. And uh, maybe we will have to have a uh, beer on Mike's patio. That works for me. Yeah, I'm in. All right. You're welcome. Adios. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all and have a great night.